Hi, this is Sebastian Rushworth. Welcome to my podcast where I talk to the most interesting and original thinkers in health and medicine. My guest today is Dr. David Grimes. David is a physician in the UK and a specialist in gastroenterology. And for the last four decades or so, he's had a special interest in vitamin D and its central role in the functioning of the immune system. And he's written multiple books on the topic. And ever since uh, the COVID pandemic began, he's uh, tried to uh, understand uh, what the uh, role the what role vitamin D deficiency has in in um, in more severe COVID, and uh, he's uh, been actively campaigning to try to get as many people as possible to supplement with the vitamin D uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, preventing more severe disease. Um, so, in this conversation, we talk about vitamin D, why it uh, has this central role in immune function, why why we evolved to be so dependent on uh, vitamin D. Um, we talk about the studies on vitamin D in relation to COVID, uh, both the observational studies and the randomized trials and what they show. Um, so I think for anyone who wants to have a more complete understanding of vitamin D, its role in the immune system and its its role in in COVID nineteen. I think uh, this is uh, really a one stop shop. So please enjoy my conversation with uh, Dr. David Grimes. Hi, David. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me today. It's a pleasure, Sebastian. Very nice of you to invite me. So. Um, uh, your research focus for, for I guess, a couple of decades at least has been uh, vitamin D. Um, and uh, it, it's been kind of on the interrelationship of vitamin D and the immune system, if I understand that uh, correctly. My interest in vitamin D has been a research interest for 30 years, but not in a biochemical way. I'm not a chemist. I'm a clinical doctor, and I've only been a clinical doctor. And what has interested me over the years is why some people are very susceptible to illness, and not just one illness, but a variety of illnesses, and why that is, and what makes some people, it's not just individuals, but it's groups of people, what makes them particularly vulnerable to illness, where other people tend to be relatively immune. So it is susceptibility to illness. And I take the view that illness is a combination of the disease and its cause, together with the susceptibility factors. And I came to regard vitamin D as the major susceptibility factor. I was looking in particular at poor people. I live in the northwest of England, in a town that is a poor town. And it has a high immigrant population also. <clears throat> and um, I wondered why the Asian immigrants and the poor people, the poor indigenous people, were particularly ill, relatively speaking, compared to people who live where I live, only 10 miles away in a rural setting. Very, very different. And I came to conclude that it was all about exposure to the sun. And therefore, with or without vitamin D. The major factor for being ill is vitamin D deficiency. Why, why exactly is vitamin D important for the immune system to function properly? This goes back millennia. Um, <laughs> it, it started one and a half billion years ago with plankton, who produce a chemical called 7-dehydrocholesterol. And this is a sunscreen, because plankton are at the surface of the, of the sea, and if they create this chemical, 
then they don't get killed by the ultraviolet light from the sun because this chemical 7DHC, uh, it absorbs the ultraviolet light and it acts as a sunscreen. By chance, when it absorbs UV light, it gets turned into vitamin D. Now, plankton had no use whatsoever for vitamin D. And it was a billion years later, 500,000 years later, the Cambrian explosion of advanced life forms that was enabled by immunity, which means defense against bacteria and viruses. And there was a particular chemical produced complex protein, VDR, which we now call vitamin D receptor, that was created and that allowed immunity to develop. But the interesting thing is the VDR, which came into being about 500,000, 500 million years ago, it required vitamin D to be activated. And that's the key is vitamin D. Why that happened is one of the major mysteries of evolution. We'll never know, but it's a fact that the immune system does not work unless vitamin D is there to activate it. And uh, I guess the reason the vitamin D receptor has been able to develop this central role in human physiology is just due to the fact that, uh, I mean, historically in the environment in which we've evolved, vitamin D has always been plentiful, kind of like vitamin C, that there's never really been a situation where before modern times where humans have been able to be vitamin D deficient. So there's never been a, 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 real, a reason for evolution to evolve a, a mechanism uh, that's independent of, of vitamin D. I'd not thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. Vitamin D deficiency is very new. It only came about in the Industrial Revolution. And before that time, everybody worked out in the fields. We're an agricultural society. And people who work in the fields have much more vitamin D than people who work inside. But with the Industrial Revolution, in Western Europe, in particular in Europe, then people became vitamin D deficient because they were inside in factories or there was terrible air pollution preventing vitamin D production by block the, the pollution blocking the sun. And then the important thing increasingly is indoor work. We don't work outdoors now. We work increasingly indoors. We spend a lot of leisure time indoors. And in hot countries, people will spend time indoors with the air conditioning. There's a very important study a hundred years ago in India, which showed that the wealthy people had the children of the wealthy people had a lot of rickets, vit severe vitamin D deficiency, and a lot of tuberculosis. Whereas the poor people working out in the fields, they um, were very healthy in comparison. So that it showed the sun, outdoor life, the sun is very, very effective in maintaining good health. But you're quite right. Evolution is a very slow process. And if we increasingly became indoor people and we, we died off, then people with alternative forms of immunity would be the survivors. But that would take millions of years. Yeah, and, and I get, I mean, evolution works in this kind of ad hoc way where it's always using what's already at hand. So something that fills one function ends up filling a different function. And if you have something that's so basic that it's kind of evolved 500 million years ago, at kind of the beginning of uh, multicellular life, then it's reasonable to assume that 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 protein is going to end up fulfilling other central functions too in the body. And in this case, it's ended up fulfilling this central role in the immune system. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. What, as I say, it's the vitamin D immunity story started off 500 million years ago. And vitamin D activates the complex protein VDR, 
which links with retinol, which is part of vitamin A, and between them they activate the genes, and they activate about 10% of the genes of our body, believe it or not. They're doing a great deal of things apart from activating immunity, but no one's quite clear yet what those things are. Now, part of the immune system is the activation of immune cells, one of which is the monocyte. And what happened during evolution, and this happened about, I think, 200 million years ago, is that it started to produce bone. Because early fish just had a cartilage skeleton, which was not very strong. So, evolutionary, the immune cell then became a bone cell under the influence of vitamin D to produce bone. And this was something entirely new. So then we had the development of bony fish and bony animals, and bone is the result of that. But in the vitamin D story, immunity came before the bone effects of vitamin D. But everybody knows about the bone effects because that became more obvious with rickets in the um, 19th century. Well, we can see rickets. We can see children with misshapen legs, misshapen bodies. We can see young women with pelvic deformities resulting from rickets. We can see that they have terrible problems in childbirth and die in childbirth because the baby cannot get through the pelvis. We can see all those things, they're visible. So everybody became aware of rickets and vitamin D deficiency. With immunity, we can't see immunity. We can't understand vitamin D e immunity because we can't see it. What is the specific mechanism uh, through which uh, vitamin D regulates the immune system? If you're able to explain it <laughs> in a few minutes, maybe that's impossible. It's like when you're driving a car. You... You're going along on a, a flat road and you're just hardly touching the accelerator and you're not using up very much fuel at all. And then you find a long hill. And when you get to a long hill, a steep hill, you have to put your foot down. And you can see your miles per gallon drops enormously. You might have been getting 40 miles per gallon and suddenly you're getting 15 miles per gallon or something like that. It's the same with vitamin D and immunity. If everything's nice and quiet and peaceful, and if we're all having a happy time with no major uh, dangers around us, then we can manage with not very much vitamin D. But the point is that like fuel in the car, vitamin D is used up. Like your fuel can only be used once, when a molecule of petroleum is burnt, it, it, it's, it's gone. That's the end of it. It doesn't replenish itself. You have to fill the tank again. And the same with vitamin D. When, vitamin, when a molecule of vitamin D is used up in the immune process, it cannot be used again. That's the end of it. You've got to replenish. You've got to refill your tank. And it's particularly so when you're going uphill. And we can look at, put it like this that the past few years have been fairly happy, good health, everything's been fine, very healthy populations. And this COVID-19 pandemic hits us. And suddenly it's like going up a hill. We're challenged, we're immunologically challenged by the, by the infection. Now, if we've got a full tank of vitamin D, we're okay, we can get through it. We get the infection, our immunity escalates, vitamin D is used up, we have enough of it to see us through, and so we recover. But for people with very little vitamin D reserve in the bodies, when they get bad COVID infection, they don't have enough vitamin D. The vitamin D is used up, and the immune system fails. And because the immune system is failing, they have to go to intensive care, etc., and they die. 
And it's terrible to see it. And in this country, in the UK, we've had 150,000 people die. Of, or we say COVID-19 related deaths. They needn't have happened. These people were deficient in vitamin D, fundamentally. But nobody bothered to test them. We can tell they were by the characteristics of the people concerned. And we, the vitamin D is consumed. We need a good supply in advance. When you go on a long car journey, you fill your tank with petrol and you make sure you've got a full tank in case you, met, in case you have to go a long way or up steep hills without enough petrol in, in reserve. Now, I have a good reserve of fuel in my car. I, you know, it, it has a, a, a 70 litre, um, it's a Volvo, it has a 70 litre uh, capacity in the fuel tank. That's a big tank, costs a lot of money to fill it up. But never mind, it goes a long way on a, fuel, on a, a tank of fuel. And my blood level of vitamin D is about the same. Not 70 litres, but 70 nanograms per mil. And I've got plenty of vitamin D in reserve in my body. Like my car has plenty of fuel in reserve in its tank. So be like a Volvo. Have a big tank, have plenty of vitamin D, like the car has plenty of fuel. Now, what happens is that vitamin D is produced in the skin. 80% of it is produced in the skin. We, I mentioned that plankton produce 7-dehydrocholesterol. It's an oil, simple oil. We do the same. We produce it in our skin. And the sun shines on our skin like it shines on plankton and it converts this 7-DHC into vitamin D. Now, vitamin D in itself has no activity. So plankton didn't need it. We don't need vitamin D itself. We need it in an activated form. So the vitamin D that we produce in the skin and also the vitamin D that we can take in our diet, it goes to the liver. And it sits in the liver and it is slowly, there's no urgency, it is slowly converted into activated form called calcifidiol or calcidiol or 25-OHD. It's a hydroxylated form. Now, the liver process is like a canal journey. It is slow because there's no urgency to it. We get the sun every day. And we gradually have to replenish our supplies. Now, it takes about two weeks for a, a big dose, a, a tablet dose of vitamin D. It takes two weeks before it's fully activated. And it, then it is in the blood in this form, calcifidiol. That is, the, that is the reserve form that's circulating in the blood. And it's waiting there. That is the fuel tank, basically. The fuel tank of the car is our blood, which is, the, carries the reserve of activated vitamin D. Now, when we get an infection, the, the body... There are something called dendritic cells in the skin and in the mucosa of the lungs, etc. All surfaces have dendritic cells. Dendritic means have root. Dendros is the Greek for root. And it's like the roots of a tree. Can you imagine the roots of a tree going through all the ground? The dendritic cells form this network in the skin, in the mucosa of the respiratory tract, etc. And they pick up the signal that there is an infection happening from a bacterium or a virus. And that signal is then sent to the lymph cells, sorry, the, the immune cells. Now the immune cells then need to be activated. So signals go back to say, we need activation, going back to the nucleus of the cells. Now it's the nucleus of the cell that drives the system. The nucleus of the cell has a small supply of the highly activated form of vitamin D, that's 125-OHD, or calcitriol. And that is what activates the genes with VDR, activates VDR and the genes. It's the very activated form of vitamin D, calcitriol, I'll call it. So calcitriol then 
starts to activate vitamin D, uh, vitamin the VDR. And we need more VDR then. And so the genes produce more VDR, which demands more vitamin D. And so that vitamin D is taken into the cells from the blood and is further activating the calcitriol. And this is a feedback escalation. And it can increase 75-fold the activity of the VDR vitamin D action on the genes and the escalation of immunity that goes with it. You said that uh, it takes about uh, two weeks for inactivated vitamin D to become th the part activated form, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Um, I guess that means uh, if, I mean, uh, you can't just start taking vitamin D today and think you have reasonable protection a week from now. You need to be kind of building up your reserves of of uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin d over an extended period of time for it to have a, a noticeable effect is that correct that's correct it has a preventative value and it needs to be taken before we we um the infection hits us some interesting work in this <laughs> see most of the public health initiatives during this pandemic, most of the leadership, we'll say, during this pandemic has been made by mathematicians and pharmaceutical scientists and not by medical doctors and medical scientists. They've been effectively left out of the story. But these are the people who know about, it's the medical scientists who know about vitamin D. Now, in Spain, there's a group of medical scientists who realized that vitamin D was very important in COVID-19. But they realized that if you take people who are being admitted to hospital, it was what you might call too late to give them vitamin D because two weeks is a long time. You know, if I were admitted to hospital with pneumonia and someone said, and the doctor said to me, we're going to give you an antibiotic in two weeks time, I wouldn't be very happy, nor would my wife and family be very happy. They say, what do you mean? Give them an antibiotic in two weeks time, we'd be dead by then. And that's absolutely true. We've got to be realistic. I want to receive an antibiotic the moment to get into hospital. And I want to get in an adequate dose that's going to work more or less straight away. Well, the doctors in Spain understood this and they said it's no good giving critically ill people vitamin D, the raw vitamin D, they'll be dead by the time it works or on the intensive care unit. So they decided to give the activated form of vitamin D, the 25 OHD, the form that's been activated within the liver and circulates in the blood. Calcifidiol is the other name for it. And they gave that in two big studies. No, not weren't big. They couldn't possibly be big studies. They gave them in uh, Cordoba and Barcelona. And they had a dramatic effect on reducing the length of time in hospital, reducing the necessity for intensive care and reducing the death rate substantially. That was fantastic for Cordoba and Barcelona. The medical scientists there led the way, but no one took any notice really. So it's only Spain that's doing this. We need bigger trials, etc., etc. So we just let people die rather than using the treatment that had been established in Spain. But Brazil did something different. A study in Brazil said, well, we think vitamin D might be helpful in people admitted to hospital who are critically ill. And so they looked at people who were admitted to the intensive care units, said, right, we've got to give these people vitamin D. So they did. And guess what? There was no benefit. Of course, there was no benefit. These people were days away from death. And you can't expect 
vitamin D to do any good if it's not going to be active for one or two weeks. So that showed the difference. Brazil and Spain showed the difference between giving raw vitamin D and giving activated vitamin D in the form of calcifediol. It has to be given activated. It's not going to be going on a canal journey if you're in a hurry. You need to move much faster than that. And that's what the calcifediol does. Now, the problem with calcifediol is there's a huge amount manufactured in the, in the world, but most of it is used for animal feed. In this country, in the United Kingdom, we feed our cattle with calcifediol. Cattle, like humans, are mainly indoors now. The cattle used to be out in fields, where I live, it's a big cattle area, used to be out in fields, but now they're inside, and so they don't trample down all the grass, etc. And the vets realise, the vets and farmers realise very well, that these cattle need um, vitamin D in some form to enable them to survive in good health with an indoor existence. And so the cattle get calcifediol. I know I've, I've spoken to our local farmers about this. They know all about it. They tell me. And I say, do you know, we value cattle more highly than we value, value humans. I suppose a cow is worth one and a half thousand uh, British pounds in value, whereas I'm not worth anything at all. Human dies, well, tough, isn't it? A cattle dies, oh, dear me, we lost one and a half thousand pounds there. So the, the, the vets and the farmers are ahead of the game. So calcifediol, 25-OHD, is licensed for use in animal feed, but it's not licensed for use in the UK or North America for human consumption. It's crazy. So this Spanish study you mentioned, the Spanish randomized trial, I, it was published, I think, a year and a half ago. Um, and and uh, like you say, it showed these impressive results in terms of a, a big reduction in um, intensive care admissions. Uh, at the same time, uh, it was quite a small study. I think 50 or 100. It was a sm small study. And normally when you have a small study that shows impressive results, the next thing you do is do a big study with the same drug to to try to test it and confirm the results and 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 especially in a pandemic you'd think that we'd be in a hurry to do that confirmatory study uh, but now it's it's uh, a year and a half later and 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 uh, there still hasn't been any new randomized trial to to see well is it true does calcifediol work or doesn't it work why do you think that is? Well, it does work. It was shown in the trial. It does work. Big trials are necessary to show small results, small benefits. Small trials are all that's necessary to show big benefits. No question about it. The idea of having a big trial was to kick the can down the road. Oh, well, let, let's... What can we do to get rid of calcifediol until the vaccines come along? I know we say it's got to be a big trial. Big trials cost huge amounts of money. And when I say huge amounts of money, I mean millions of pounds. Recruiting people is a problem, especially if they're sick. There aren't many sick people in one hospital. You know, you, you can't do big trials throughout all the hospitals. It's too complicated. It doesn't work. It's okay. You know, the pharmaceutical companies do clinical trials in the community, in fit and healthy people frequently for prevention, or with hypertension. There are no end of people with hypertension around the place for clinical trials. And they have, it costs millions of pounds to do these trials, requires enormous organisation. And the pharmaceutical companies are very good at that, excellent at it, they've been well practised. When we're dealing with vitamin D, we're not dealing with a pharmaceutical agent. We're dealing with correction of vitamin D deficiency, which is an entirely different thing. And you don't need many people to show that. Small trials are perfectly adequate. Now, the first Spanish trial in Cordoba was kicked into touch by two UK 
professors. One was in Birmingham, and he said the trial's too small, it's no good, without any justification. The other was a professor from Glasgow who said, well, the blood levels of vitamin D are low because it's consumed by the infection. Well, we know that. So that was a lot of nonsense as well. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology undertook another analysis of the Spanish Cordoba uh, trial results. And they came to the conclusion that there was nothing wrong with the conduct of the trial. There was nothing wrong with the results of the trial. It was a perfectly legitimate trial and the results should stand. But everybody ignored this analysis from uh, the MIT. And by that time, everyone had forgotten about it. Now, when it came into the second Spanish trial from Barcelona, one British London-based professor said, oh, this trial isn't very good. It's not good enough. He just said, it's not good enough. And everybody believed him. And these three professors influenced what we call NICE, our National Institute for, Clini for Clinical and Care Effectiveness in the UK, which is very, very influential around the world. And NICE said, do not use this calcifediol effectively. They said, the words were, the results of this trial should not influence the way in which patients are treated in this country meaning don't use it. It's completely irresponsible. You know, how three people can cause so many deaths is beyond belief. How we allow them to get away with it. And who stands up to protest? Me. How many other people? Well, quite a lot of individuals. We don't get in the main media at all, though. Well, one thing that strikes me as... Um interesting is that um earlier in the pandemic there was a uh, widespread use of uh, remdesivir it's kind of fallen out of favor now but uh for a while it was uh, very popular and its initial popularity was based also on a, a small study i think it had like uh, around 100 people and and it it didn't even show this dramatic uh, uh, reduction in in ICU admissions. It showed a, a kind of marginal reduction in hospital length of stay, but and yet that was enough for it to become uh, for remdesivir to become one of the primary treatments. Whereas another small study of uh, vitamin D, this widely available generic. Uh, uh, product that shows a much larger effect size gets completely ignored and, and no one's interested in in trying to replicate it. It shows that the this pandemic has been a very good opportunity for transferring money from the poor, which is 99.9% of, .9 of us, to the very, very wealthy. And this, this is what's happening, I'm afraid. There are huge amounts of money being made by companies manufacturing vaccinations, for example. But no money from there's no money in vitamin D, and there is no person who's driving vitamin D. There's no company driving vitamin D. It's all grassroots. Now, I'll give you an example of how effective vitamin D can be. Starting on about the 20th of March in 2020. For, for, uh, during a period of six weeks, 26 doctors died, working doctors died in the UK from COVID-19. I've got names, photographs of all of them. And of those 26 doctors who died, only one was white. All the others were African or South Asian ethnicity. There was, it happened in Stockholm as well, that pe in general, people of African Asian ethnicity were dying in greater numbers than expected during the first part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It was always put down to socioeconomic deprivation. Now, the 25 working doctors who died were not 
socio-economically deprived. They had good incomes, they would have had big houses, no overcrowding, no problems at all. They died because their only difference in them and the other doctors were they had dark skins which do not produce much vitamin D. We know very well that they will have been vitamin D deficient. Now I have two friends. A Professor Parag Singhal, who's a professor of endocrinology in, um, in, in Western Superman near Bristol in England. And the other is a Professor David Anderson, now retired, pro former professor of um, medicine and endocrinology, who I've known actually for about 40 years. We worked together about 40 years ago, very briefly. Well, we got together knowing about all these doctors dying, these dark skinned doctors dying. And Professor Singal is the chairman, or the national secretary, I should say, of the British Association of Doctors of Indian Origin, called BAPIO. He therefore had the email addresses of all the doctors of Indian origin, but he also could link to people in a similar position to him of other ethnic groups of doctors, like, for example, the Association of Doctors of Nigerian origin, or think of a country, Pakistani origin, whatever. All these exist. And he sent a letter, did Parag Singhal, Professor Singhal, an email to all his doctors of Indian origin and cascaded that to the, um, the other groups so that all doctors of ethnic minorities in this country received an email saying, take vitamin D immediately. Otherwise, you're likely, you have a high risk of death from COVID-19. I provided the evidence from all the 25 out of 26. He had all the names of the, of the doctors. And Professor David Anderson had a large supply of vitamin D, which he, would, which he provided to any doctor who, who required it. Those deaths of Indian doctors stopped about two weeks after the letter from Professor Singal, the email, went out to them all. It stopped abruptly. Within six weeks, 25 doctors dying, doctors of uh, ethnic minorities. Since then, there was one in September 2020, and there was one in, in uh, about September of 2021. That's all brought it to a halt. I think that, I mean, that's pretty compelling evidence. If you have this uh, period where there's a, a massive number of deaths and, 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 and suddenly after you get the, the word out, uh, it, it drops off dramatically. And uh, I, I mean, just the fact that, uh, like you said, that uh, of all the doctors dying of COVID in, in the UK, more than 90% had darker skin and, and it's it's hard to explain that uh, away as the result of of the structural racism or or cramped living conditions or or anything else because like you say i mean uh, if if you're a doctor you're regardless of where you come what part of the world you come from you're a highly paid professional and 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 it's it's hard to see that that could be due to anything else other than than vitamin D when you have this massive difference between light skinned and dark skinned doctors in terms of who's getting severe covid and who's dying of it you could look at it this way you have two boys are born we'll say boys there could be girls doesn't really matter two people are born in let's say Uganda, and one of them is clever and passes exams, becomes a doctor, comes to the United Kingdom, comes to live in London or somewhere, and works as a doctor in England. His brother, remaining in Uganda, wasn't actually very clever, but he gets around and um, 
but he doesn't do particularly well. He doesn't become a doctor, and he stays in Uganda. Now, the, the clever doctor, who's now wealthy, living in England, he has had about 1,000 times an increased risk of, get, of dying from COVID-19 as his brother, who stayed in Uganda. Is it is it possible to overdose on vitamin D? Is that something people need to be worried about at all, or and and what types of doses are are reasonable and and ideal? Overdose with vitamin D is is extremely difficult, and usually comes about by accident. And the accident is very easy to understand. Um, just to put it in perspective. We've had 150,000 people die from COVID-19 in the UK uh, during the pandemic. I'm not aware of any single person who's died from vitamin D poisoning or toxicity. It's easy to check up, up on. It's easy to reverse. And it's very, very rare indeed. Now, the amount of vitamin D that we should be taking is about 4,000 units a day. Now, one unit is the daily requirement of a 10 gram immature mouse. And that's how vitamin D was measured 100 years ago. It couldn't be measured in mass units then. It had to be measured in biological units of what keeps a one day old mouse in good skeletal health. Sorry, a 10 gram mouse in good skeletal health, and that's one unit. So if a 10 gram mouse requires one unit, a 60 kilogram human, or well, it could be a 60 gram mouse, I suppose, but there aren't any, a 60 kilogram human would require 6,000 units. That's gram for gram. So 6,000 units is about the amount of vitamin D that we require. So we should say, well, let's let's be on the safe side and take half of that. And taking 3,000 units is fine, but perhaps taking 6,000 units a day is better. Now, if we go back to 4,000 units, we can now measure vitamin D in mass units, in micrograms. And 4,000 units is 100 micrograms. Now, most people have never heard of micrograms. It's a scientific measurement, not something you see in normal life. You know, you don't, we, we don't take medicines usually in micrograms, usually milligrams of something or other. And we don't, we don't buy our food in micrograms, it's only milligrams and grams, etc. And so when people see MCG for a microgram, they think it's a milligram. Now a milligram, is a thousand times a microgram. So let's go back to taking a hundred micrograms of vitamin D. And people misread and say, oh, it's a it's hundred milligrams of vitamin D. Now, a hundred micrograms of vitamin D is 4,000 units. A hundred milligrams of vitamin D is 400,000 units. And taking 400,000 units of vitamin D every day is going to lead to serious problems. And I've seen it in the newspapers. Take vitamin D, 100 milligrams a day. And the headline should have said micrograms. I hope nobody took any notice. But very few people have ever heard of micrograms. And those they confuse it with milligrams. And so it's best to keep to units. And say take about 4,000 units a day. But the amount of vitamin D we should take is enough to raise our blood vitamin D level above 40 nanograms per mil, which is 100 nanomoles per litre. I will just mention one thing about vitamin D dosage. And that is that old people do not produce vitamin D. Old people have dry, thin, dry skin. It's dry because it doesn't produce the oils, and the oil it doesn't produce is 7-DHC. 
So if the sun contain if the skin does not produce 78C, you can leave an old person in the sun as long as you like, and there will be no vitamin D produced. Vitamin D deficiency is inevitable in the elderly, and it's not really because they're inside all the time, that is a factor, but it's because the skin is dry and lacks the essential oil 78C. So all old people require vitamin D, just in a standard dose. They don't need a high dose, they need a standard dose. And so it goes for people with dark skins, um, ethnic minorities from Asia and Africa. These people also do not produce vitamin D in the skin. Well, they don't produce very much of it anyway, because the melanin in the skin absorbs the UV light and prevents it from converting 78C. But all they need is a normal amount of vitamin D supplement, just the same as you or I or an ill person. But the other group are the obese. Now, if we expose a thin person and an obese person to ultraviolet exposure, we find out that the obese person will produce only 20% of the amount of circulating vitamin D in the blood than the thin person. So what happens to it? The vitamin D is being produced in the obese people, but it is being trapped in the fat cells of the body. Vitamin D is a fat, it's an oil, and it gets trapped in the fat cells of the body and it does not get into the blood. So people who are obese require more vitamin D than people who are thin. There was a systematic review in the British Medical Journal a few years ago of um, vitamin D for for the prevention of infections. And um, uh, as I remember it, there was a, a big reduction in frequency with a daily vitamin D supplement, but no reduction at all with uh, bolus dosing. Um, does it matter is how often people take vitamin D? Should they be taking a daily supplement and avoiding bolus dosing? Or what's your opinion on the matter? Well, I actually take vitamin D only once a week. I take 20,000 units every Sunday. Now, you might call that a bolus dose. I'm not sure. It's possible to take it once a month. But it's really once a day or once a week is ideal. I know it's possible to take it all once every three months. We'll say uh, 300,000 units every three months, but that's not ideal. If you give, I mentioned earlier on that when the vitamin D as 125-OHD can only be used once and then it's inactivated. That's in, it's inactivated by being converted into a derivative called 2425-OHD. Now, it is, I believe that if a big bolus is given of vitamin D, that switches on the genes which inactivate vitamin D, converting into 2425-OHD. And I believe that is why a bolus is undesirable. It's better than not taking any vitamin D, but I think once a day or once a week is ideal. And once a week is, to my mind, easier to remember. And it doesn't matter. I say I take it every Sunday. If I forget, I take it on the following day. And if I don't take it this Sunday, I'll take double the dose the following week. It's not critical. It's not like insulin. Well, you've got to take it every day or twice a day. It's not like that at all. It's like vitamin C. The body can store vitamin D like it can store vitamin C. The body can't store insulin. Uses it straight away. So it's not critical like insulin, but it means or blood pressure tablets, etc. But um, it's okay to, uh, taking it once a week.
you mentioned that uh, there are these two randomized trials that uh, that give one that gave calcifediol and one that gave calcitriol and that both showed uh, Im- impressive results and then on top of that we have this mass of observational data uh, showing a strong uh, correlation between um, um, low vitamin D levels and, and the increased risk of, of severe disease. Um, and on top of that, we have this fact that, um, I mean, vitamin D is cheap, widely available, uh, uh, safe, at, at least at the, at, uh, at the doses that, uh, that uh, we are talking about here. Um, I mean, there. From my perspective, there are only potential upsides to a, a government recommending that everyone take a vitamin D supplement, and there are no downsides. So, I mean, why why isn't this happening? Why are governments not recommending their populations to take vitamin D supplements? A good question. I say, well, is it ignorance, or is it ignoring the evidence? These leaders, our leaders at the time of this pandemic, they cannot be ignorant. Many of them must have the knowledge that I have about vitamin D. You know, they, they, they're not stupid. Well, if they, they either, either they are stupid or they're deliberately ignoring the vitamin D story. And if they're ignoring the vitamin D evidence, why on earth are they doing so? We know so well, as you say that vitamin D levels um, predict serious and fatal COVID-19. Why is the action not being taken? All they do is demand, either they ignore the evidence or they demand research that cannot be done, like large scales randomized controlled trials, cannot be done. There's no possibility of it. So it's basically Pascal's wager. Um, what are the downsides and what are the upsides? Now, the downside of vitamin D, giving vitamin D when it's not necessary, is zero. The downside of not giving vitamin D when it is necessary is many people dying. What are the upsides? What are the upside of giving vitamin D if it doesn't work, well, it, there's no upside, it doesn't matter. What's the advantage of giving vitamin D? If vitamin D is necessary, it means people don't die. It stands to sense that we give vitamin D. That's based on Pascal's wager, as it's called. Now, other people say, well, there's no proof that vitamin D works. That is not true. That shows a misunderstanding of proof. And when people say to me, there's no proof, I just say, well, what do you mean by proof? And they get stuck then. They say, well, uh, I I, I suppose it's a randomized controlled trial. And that is not true because we have. We know the limits of a randomized controlled trial. For example, we could have done a randomized controlled trial of um, of um, of alcohol consumption in respect of driving, we give drivers a good you know a, 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 lot, a bottle of wine to drink, a few pints of beer, a bottle of whiskey, and say drink this a certain amount of alcohol, and then go out and drive your car and let's see what happens. And we say to others, um, you go out and see what happens when you drive your car. We're not going to give you any alcohol at all. And then we check the blood levels of alcohol and we can find a balance where blood alcohol relates to car accidents. We're not so stupid as to do that. We use observational evidence. And the observational evidence is that a high blood level of alcohol in the blood is associated with with car accidents. No question about it. So we say, don't drive your car when you've got a lot of alcohol. We do the same with seat belts. We don't con- construct a randomized controlled trial. We use observational data. You could say the same um, in jumping out of a, an, air, an airborne aircraft without a parachute um, or without, with or without a parachute. We don't do controlled trials. We just 
accept what we call common sense, some experience, some knowledge of the world in general. And when it came down to cigarette smoking being being a cause of lung cancer, we didn't do a controlled trial. We used observational data of doctors in the nineteen in the nineteen fifties onwards, and we showed that smoking twenty cigarettes a day or more is associated with a high probability of lung cancer. Actually, only a ten percent probability of lung cancer. Uh, compared to almost zero percent in people who don't smoke at all. So we've got to use observational data. We've got to use um, predict, uh, prediction. We've got to use temporality. We've got to show that the low vitamin D level precedes the um, death from COVID-19, which has been done. We've got to show that the studies are reproducible. We've got about 25 studies of vitamin D levels related to COVID-19. We've got to use controlled trials if we can, knowing that there are ethical limitations to the use of controlled trials. No question about that. We're not going to deprive people of um, vitamin D if there's very, very good evidence that it works, because ethics means that people have to have informed consent. So we'll say, the research so far shows that vitamin D is deficiency is very bad for you and vitamin D is very good for you. We want you to go into an experiment where you might be given a placebo rather than vitamin D. Would you, prefer, would you go into this trial, please? And say, um, well, I'll go into it as long as I have vitamin D, if of any sense. So there are limits to what can be done. We've got plausibility. We've got experience. We've got basic science. Everything is there to uh, uh, the components of proof. And it's in the legal jargon, where is the weight of evidence? Is the weight of evidence the vitamin D is very helpful? Or is the weight of evidence the vitamin D is no good? And it's a, it's a judgment. Like in a court of law, it's a judgment. I think that's a nice note to end this uh, conversation on. Thank you so much, David, for coming and spending this uh, time with me. It's been a great pleasure. We've covered a lot of ground. It's a big subject. And I hope I've been helpful. And thank you very much for inviting me. Guess what? What you just listened to was not the full interview. In order to get access to the full-length uncut version of the interview, you'll need to sign up as a patron, which you can do at patreon.com slash Sebastian Rushworth. Patrons get access to a private podcast feed with full-length versions of all the interviews I do. They also get access to my private forum and all the interesting conversations happening there. And they gain the ability to send me private uh, direct messages. I always respond to messages from my patrons. So please support my work by uh, becoming a patron and uh, signing up at patreon.com slash Sebastian Rushworth.